Uh, but what I wanted to do tonight is speak to a very common theme as part of our secular and skeptical age, which is this experience of questioning Christianity. And if you've got a Bible with you, I invite you to open to John chapter 20. We're going to be reading from verses 19 all the way through to 31. And it says this, On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, their sins are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, was one of the twelve, but he was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these things I have written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Now, what's fascinating to me about this passage is that it flies in the face of so much of the common perception that many Christians, let alone skeptical people, have when it comes to religious belief. There is right now in our broader cultural moment a huge movement of deconstruction, deconversion, and doubt. We hear every week new stories of high-profile Christians, pastors, celebrities, musicians who have walked away from the faith and put up posts claiming, I have these questions and there are no answers. And we hear this popular phenomenon of deconstruction, people that have grown up within the church and that have experienced a parent's faith or their church's faith or their school's faith, but have come to the point where when they went with questions, certain things that they've been told just didn't stand up in the light of scrutiny, that some of the strange traditions of their church or the extra cultural expressions that have just been added on as baggage to their belief system, that when these things started being questioned, all of a sudden the entire system, the house of their beliefs, began to crumble and they deconstructed in their faith. And then we hear of doubts, of the growing population in Australia. And it'll be interesting to see these latest census results, but now who identify as having no religious affiliation, when they're asked, why won't you consider the God question? Why isn't Christianity a live option for belief? They bring up a range of belief blockers whether it's Christian uh, ideas around sexuality, whether it's questions around hell or judgment, whether it's the problem of evil and suffering. There are a whole host of doubts that are so big in people's minds that it keeps them from being able to think that the God story could really be true, that the Christian story has any good news to offer. These deconversions, deconstructions, and doubts. And if we're honest, these are not expressions outside the church. Doubt is so often part and parcel of the Christian experience. And what you may be surprised to find is that almost all of the biggest questions that you'll find people asking today are actually put on the lips of characters in the Christian story. In fact, they're often asked with far more raw and difficult emotion than many of the ways you'll hear them framed even on the internet today. Take someone like Job who experiencing immense suffering in his life in the Old Testament, of having his kids wiped out, of his health stripped from him, of his wealth destroyed by natural disaster or stolen away by enemy raiders, only to have his wife turn on him and say, why don't you curse God and die? The God thing didn't really work out. Why don't you just give up on all of it? 
to have him then to give voice to his complaint, to cry out from the bitterness of his soul, to ask questions like, why didn't I perish at birth? Why is life so hard? To have someone like King David in Psalm 10.1 ask questions like, my God, why do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? To have someone like the Apostle Paul, having been stoned and beaten and imprisoned and shipwrecked and hungry and homeless, say in 2 Corinthians that he despaired even of life itself. Someone like Elijah in uh, 1 Kings 19 verse 4, where he says, I've had enough, Lord. Take my very life. Just wants to tap out. And these are people who at different points in their experience of life just found so many either intellectual puzzles, stuff that didn't make sense or were so overcome with the anxiety and the struggles of life that they just didn't feel like the Christian story stacked up to their expectations. That sometimes a relationship with an all-powerful and an all-loving God wasn't exactly what they thought it was cracked out to be. And so they had questions. And this experience of questioning Christianity is something that we need to take seriously. Because for a lot of people, like the deconstructionists and the deconversion stories, when they begin to ask these questions, they feel like those questions are off limits. And that there was no one responding to those questions, having lived 25 or 30 years in church. And that is an absolute travesty. Because we see here just one small example in the Gospel of John. Jesus welcomes doubters. That far from pushing people away or shutting down their questions, Jesus has this incredible habit of surrounding him, often sometimes his closest friends and followers, with people that are plagued with doubts. We see here Tonums, sometimes called Didymus, who had been with Jesus for a couple of years, who had seen him walk on water, turn water into wine, multiply food, miraculously heal people of all manner of diseases, raise a few of them from the dead, He knew the character of his friends, the fellow disciples. Jesus had predicted his death and resurrection. The women that morning had gone to the tomb, found it empty. Some of them had claimed to have seen Jesus. Peter and John had run to the tomb just to confirm their story. And now they're gathered together that evening. But for some reason, Thomas isn't there. He's gone out to get the unleavened pizza. And while he's away, Jesus appears to the rest of the disciples. And he convinces them that he really is risen from the dead, that it's true. He shows that he's physically alive. You can touch him. He ate with them. He hugged them in different stories. I'm real. I'm not an apparition or a hallucination. You can cling on to this incredible hope that new creation is dawning with my resurrection from the dead. But then when Thomas comes back and they say, Thomas, you are never going to believe this. He acts like the ancient David Hume, right? The first empiricist. I will not believe it unless I can touch it with my own hands or see it with my own eyes. Then I will believe. And what's so often missed is the little detail at the end of that line. A week later. For an entire week after Jesus had resurrected from the dead, he was comfortable to leave Thomas one of his apostles, one of the key leaders of the new Christian movement to be doubting the very resurrection of Jesus. He didn't rush in, afraid that the first step of someone asking a hard question or finding it difficult to be able to trust the reality of God's resurrection. He didn't need to patch that over in a hurry. He let him sit in his doubts. He let him process what it would take for him to be willing to believe. And then he actually turned up and provided him just such evidence. Now stop doubting and believe. And this isn't an isolated incident, actually. If you jump over to Matthew's gospel, Matthew 28, you'd be very familiar with maybe the Great Commission. If you've been in church for a couple of years or so, you've probably heard the words, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given unto me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'll be with you, even to the very end of the age. They call it the Great Commission, the mission of all Christians everywhere to help people come to eternal life through the knowledge of Jesus Christ and to find their purpose here in light of his story. It's familiar verses, but do you know what verse immediately precedes that passage? Matthew 28, verse 17. And it describes that the disciples had been sent to Galilee where they would see Jesus. And then it says, and when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. 
Uh, just get this in your mind. These are Jesus' closest friends and followers. They've seen everything that he did in the flesh. They were there for those moments. And now the resurrected Jesus is literally in front of them. They can reach out and touch him, speak with him, hug him. And yet as some of them are worshiping with their hands raised, the people next to them are going, I don't know if I can believe this. This is so out far outside my skeptical grid, right? Dead people stay dead. And he was really dead. Like Jesus was uber dead. He was flayed, he was crucified, and he was stuck with a spear in the heart, just to be sure. And yet he's in front of me. How am I meant to process this? And they were still caught up with doubts. And then Jesus commissions those very doubters to be the leaders in his church, to go out and make disciples of all nations. Jesus welcomes doubters. He is far more comfortable with doubt than the modern church has tended to become. Because the truth is that far from being an enemy of faith, doubt can actually be a doorway to a deeper faith, as it was here with Thomas. You see, for Thomas, he had this challenge where I can't believe this. This is so far outside my understanding as to what normally happens with the laws of nature. This is such a big miracle and it affects my life in such profound ways. I can't cling on to this unless I'm sure. And so the doubt then creates an opportunity for him to explore the foundations of what he believes. Do I really have good reasons to believe in the goodness of God and in the truth of the Christian story? Because these really are the fundamental questions behind every question I've ever been asked in Q&A. When we're talking about things like, hasn't science buried God? Or why would you trust a book that was written by goat herders in the Bronze Era? Or why are you willing to accept this crazy idea of miracles when it seems to go against the sort of scientific consensus of our day that that thing would be possible in a closed universe? And any of these sort of broad questions, what they're really asking is, is it true? Can I rationally accept that this is true, that I have good evidence to believe it? But all the biggest questions, the hardest ones, tend to actually be in a different category, where people are asking around questions of sex and sexuality and the Christian sexual ethic, when they're asking around how would a good God allow suffering, when they're asking is how would God send people to hell? The, the real question behind all of these questions was actually the question that was seeded all the way back in the Garden of Eden by a serpent. Can you really take God at his word? Can you really trust that God cares about you, that he has your best intentions at heart, that he really does love you, or should you doubt the character and the goodness of God? So is it true, is God good, as sort of the foundation of every single question that I'm ever asked? They're the big question behind the other questions, the one that people are really asking. Can I believe this and can I trust him? And when it comes down to these sorts of doubts, when they come up in your own experience, whether prompted by the questions of a smart skeptic or a friend, or whether they're prompted by your own personal experience in moments of pain and frustration, of loneliness, of anxiety, what these are are a moment of opportunity for you to dig in and find out whether you have good reasons to believe in the reality of the Christian story or in the goodness of God. A number of years ago, back in 1991, they did this cool experiment over in the deserts uh, of the US where a crack team of scientists built what they called the biospheres. And there was a dodgy Paulie Shaw movie that was made about Biodome, don't watch it. But, uh, but the, the goal of these scientists was to be able to design artificial terrariums or these biomes where they could explore whether or not we'd be able to colonize space. Can we put people on Mars or the moon to actually cultivate it and live there? And so they built each one of these self-contained units and then had it mimic different ecosystems systems from around Earth's planet. And so there were some that were more rainforest, some that were ocean style, some that were desert style. And so, you know, our, our good friend Jeff Wilson would enjoy some of these, sort of surviving in there for two years. And, and the, the scientists locked themselves in there for two years to try and explore, cut off from Earth's atmosphere, what would happen to the plants and animal life. Can we really do this? And they made some fascinating discoveries. You can read all about them online. But one of the discoveries they made was that because they forgot to mimic all of the atmospheric conditions, many of the tree species in the savannah and the rainforest sections ended up growing up only to either stop prematurely or to fall over under the weight of their own uh, size because they forgot to build wind into the system. Now, think about how wind operates with little sapling trees as they're growing up. A storm blows in, we're very familiar with that in Queensland, and the wind pushes against these trees, and it actually creates little micro-tears in the fibres of the tree. Exactly like what happens when you're working out with weights at the gym. 
And what happens then is like with our muscles, the fibers in the tree actually grow back stronger. They call this stress wood. And it's what enables a tree to be able to continue to grow far beyond what it would have been able to otherwise had it not actually faced that resistance in the first place. And I actually think this is exactly how faith and doubt operate. That doubt is an opportunity to investigate the foundations of why you really believe what you believe. That doubt can be a doorway to a deeper faith. And far from being a blind leap in the dark, the reality is when it comes to Christian faith, that faith has its reasons. I remember being pushed so many times by people who say, oh, well, there's either faith or facts. There's religion or reason. There's God or science. You have to choose whether you're going to be an intelligent person or whether you're going to check your brain at the door of the church and buy into this gobbledygook religious belief that's basically just a delusion, right? But the idea of faith being belief in the absence of evidence, which is the way that many atheists would typify religious faith, is an alien definition when it comes to the pages of the Bible. That is not biblical faith. In fact, when the authors of the New Testament were writing, they had two Greek words, the language of the original New Testament, this common form or Koine Greek, two words that they could have chosen from to be able to communicate faith, belief, or trust. The first is nimitso which means to believe on the basis of custom or tradition. In fact, many of our beliefs operate in this way. You're growing up and you say, why, to your parents? And they give you an answer and you accept that answer uncritically, which as I've learned is often really unwise to do now as a parent. I often just say an answer to get them to stop asking. Right? But the idea of accepting what someone else tells you without investigating it for yourself, because your parents believed it, your culture believed it, your church believed it, your celebrities believed it, but whoever it is that you allowed to speak into your life, you accepted it on the basis of custom or tradition without investigating the credibility of that claim in itself. That's namitso, to believe on the basis of tradition. The second term is pustuo, which means to believe on the basis of the credibility of the claim. It's either an expert that's telling you, someone that really is in the know, someone whose character and credentials you can actually lean into and say, this person is a trustworthy source. Or you've actually investigated the evidence for yourself to see whether or not it stands up to scrutiny. Now, any hint out of all of the times in the New Testament that you're encouraged to have faith or trust or belief in God or in Jesus, any guess as to which of those two words they exclusively use? I'll give you a hint. It's not nemitso. It's pistuo. Every time. In fact, here, in, uh, as we get to John 20, 30, and 31, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written so that you may... Pistuo, believe. In other words, he spent 20 chapters outlining the case for Christ, according to the Apostle John. The seven claims that Jesus made about who he was, that I am the bread of life, I am the way, the truth, and life, the resurrection, life, all of these things, and the seven miracles that he performed to be able to back up that claim, to prove it to be true, ultimately culminating in his resurrection from the dead. Given this eyewitness evidence, given these miracles, given his fulfillment of biblical prophecy, On this basis, these things I have written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. It's given straight after an account of a guy doubting and needing more evidence. Here, you get that too. Faith, when it comes to the Christian sense, is always evidence-based. In fact, in Hebrews 11, the great hall of faith, the chapter which describes all of these people who pleased God because of their faith, they're celebrated because of their faith. This is what it says in Hebrews 11, verse 6. It says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek after him. In other words, there are two preconditions to biblical faith. And then the answers to the two questions I brought up before. Is this really true? And is God really good? Do you really have good reasons to believe that he actually exists and that he's the the kind of character that you would want to draw near to? He rewards those who diligently seek after him. This is the foundation of biblical faith. Now, you might be thinking, but Dan, what about all those passages that say, you know, it's not by, we don't walk not by faith, uh, sorry, we walk by faith and not by sight. How does that fit in to what you're telling me? And I, well, it fits in very, very well. On what basis is our faith in anyone right now? Let's take my wife, for instance. 
when I stood 10 years ago at the altar and made promises to Erin and heard her make promises back to me, was that blind faith making that kind of commitment? What was the basis of my trust? I mean, I didn't just met her the day before, right? I knew what she'd been like in the past. I certainly knew she was a real person, right? That she wasn't a figment of my imagination, a catfish account on Facebook or something like this. Other people had seen her too. I knew that she was real. I'd seen her birth certificate to sign the marriage document. I knew she was real, but I also knew what she was like. I'd seen the way that she'd been faithful to her friendships, to her family, to her promises, to her commitments in the past. I knew her character so that the person in whom I was placing my trust for an unknown future, a future I cannot yet see, my faith for the future was based on my knowledge of the past. And this is exactly what it says is true about God as well. Right now, I can't see him. If you can, sweet. But the vast majority of us, like Thomas, when he came back from that story, we don't get to see Jesus physically alive in front of us. But yet, does that mean we don't have good reasons to believe that he didn't exist? Or that he really is trustworthy? That somehow amidst the mess of this world, he can bring about something good. That somehow amidst our dying friends, he can bring about a future resurrection. That somehow in the midst of all of the cynicism and hopelessness of our age, he can imbue this world with meaning and purpose and beauty. Sometimes that can be hard to see. But my faith in him is not just a spiritual currency that I work up in some kind of emotionalism. My faith in him is found by diving back into who he was, that he really existed, and that he really was faithful to fulfill all of those promises that he made to others. Therefore, I can trust him for what I cannot yet see. So it's like if someone came to me tonight and said, Dan, your wife's cheating on you. (laughs) Now, I can't prove to you that she's being faithful. I don't have a drone following her around from above or a GPS tracker on her phone or a sleuth detective hidden here. But yet it would take a lot of evidence to dislodge my trust in her because of how well I know her, because of how well I've seen her be faithful. And so I think this is the exact kind of picture of faith has its reasons. And if you're new to the Christian story and maybe you're thinking, well, what is the real evidence for the reality of God or the trustworthiness of God? I would love to introduce you to what I call the little evidence map that I've got up behind me, just a small spattering of arguments and evidences for belief in God and belief in Jesus. There are some two dozen formal families of arguments that are advanced by academics in the literature to be able to point towards the reality of the Christian story. And if you're new to these, this is often termed what an area of Christian theology called apologetics, the idea of helping to give an answer or commend the truth of the Christian story. But I want you to be encouraged that this is a brand new area. There is literally a mountain of sweet evidence and arguments and ideas that we can dive into. Most Uh, centered, though, around the resurrection of Jesus. For the Christian, this is the hinge upon which our entire faith turns. And so if you're wondering, are there good reasons to be able to believe? Well, you're invited to launch your own investigation of the evidence. And here's the, the cool thing. When people say, I've got doubts, I've got questions, I'm never afraid. Because truth invites questioning. You see, if something really is true, It doesn't matter how much you investigate it. You get more and more confident of the truth of that story the more investigation that you do. It's only when someone tells you a story. You know, you you ask, oh, where were you last night? You know, I thought you were going to invite me out. They make up a story to say where they were. And then you start asking further follow-up questions. And all of a sudden, the story starts contradicting itself or the story contradicts the photos that you saw on Instagram. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I'm really not sure. You're busted, right? But if someone tells you a true story, It doesn't matter whether you check their GPS on their phone, their history, their credit card receipts, eyewitness testimony of others. The more and more you investigate, the more and more that story becomes something you can put your hope and faith in. Truth invites questioning. So if the Christian story really is true, if God does exist and he really is good, then I've got zero fear of people asking questions or voicing their doubts. Because if we're willing to investigate the story, the more we investigate, the more confident we should walk away to say, actually, I'm humble. I could get things wrong, but I really do think that this is true. Like with John's encouragement, I really can believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, which leads to having life in his name. And this is what I wanted to land on tonight. We explore the idea that Jesus welcomes doubters and that faith has its reasons. 
But I want to land on the idea that Jesus really is good news. Jesus really is good news. I've spent the last 15 years of my life academically and I guess professionally or, or in terms of my vocation, exploring people's doubts and questions when it comes to the Christian story. And there are always those questions that Christians hope they never get asked in a God conversation with their friends and their family. And what I've learned is that actually the hardest questions that you often hope you don't get asked are often the very place where the Christian story has something beautiful and unique to be able to offer the world. That Jesus really is good news for all of life and for everyone. You know, 10 chapters before the passage we read tonight in John chapter 10, when Jesus is describing the relationship that he wants to have with people, he says it's the thief that comes to steal and kill and destroy. Me helping to reveal what the invisible God is like, I'm not a cosmic killjoy. I'm not a moral straitjacket that's meant to stop you from having fun. I'm not here to rob life from you. I'm here to give it. I have come that you may have life and life to the full. Because the Christian story says that you were created for so much more than just chasing happiness or success or fulfillment in this life. That you were made for deep and meaningful relationships with God and with others and for a meaningful role in contributing to caring for God's planet as gardeners and governors, taking the raw materials of creation and cultivating it to foster the fruitfulness of the earth and to frame the beauty of God. Every person has a purpose. And what I've found is when it comes to the biggest questions that secular people are searching for right now, as you look at younger generations and what is fueling the growth in their mental ill health and their sense of hopelessness, is they don't know who they are and they don't know why they're here and they don't have any hope. And whether it's the Christian story of creation, that you're made in the image of God and therefore are of inestimable worth in God's eyes, you are a masterpiece of the grand designer. You were penned by God himself. Or whether it's the idea that you were put here, predestined by God's intention of all the possible universes he could have made, he chose to create this one that would have you in it that he knit you together in your mother's womb and that you're here for a reason. You have something to contribute to this human community and to the forward movement of the mission of all people and that you really do have a hope that whether this life brings you joy or suffering, whether you have incredible freedom and financial success or whether you face all kinds of struggle and limitation and felt failure, that our hope is not just in this life, but our hope is in God's new creation, where he's going to return the grand marriage of heaven and earth to make everything right, to be able to restore justice through judgment, to lift the effects of the curse, to wipe away every tear from our eyes. The Christian story is good news for all of life and for everyone. For those who are suffering, that your suffering is not meaningless but that in God's hands, somehow he can imbue it with meaning. Yeah. To shape who you become, to shape how you impact others, to promise you a hope and a future, and that he would suffer alongside us, being flayed and crucified, to be crowned with our curse in the thorns, the thistles and thorns of the earth. We have a God who would much rather suffer alongside us than leave us suffering alone. And I would much rather suffer with Jesus than without Jesus. And when you start working through all of the ways in which the Christian story speaks to life's deepest questions, he really is good news for all of life and for everyone. And so I don't know how you've come to tonight. I don't know whether you are plagued with doubts or you're desperately trying to share Jesus with friends who have all kinds of hard questions. But no matter what people are searching for right now, as they're looking out there into a dark world, I love that line from before. Jesus says, come. He is the light of the world that helps to make sense, not only to scare away the darkness, but to help you make sense of reality in the light of day. He is the good shepherd, the one who wants to lead you and guide you to quiet waters and to still pastures and to guard you from the evils of this world. He really is the resurrection and the life. Of all the people who have been religious luminaries or secular free thinkers, who are the ones that we remember in the history books, only one person's grave is empty. 
Only one person has beaten our greatest enemy, which is death. He is the resurrection and the life. And you can know that too. He is the way back to our heavenly father. The one for whose presence you were made. The contours of your soul cry out for him. Which is why Jesus described himself as the bread of life. As living water. That of all the things that you're trying to satiate those deep hungers with and that deep thirst with, he's the only one that can fill that spot. Jesus really is the one that we're all looking for. And in him is life and life to the full. And so I have over 15 years of questioning Christianity, grown more and more confidence in that I don't know as much as I should. And that there are always going to be more questions. There are always going to be moments of doubt. But yet I am more confident than ever that the Christian story is true news. That you really can bank on it with all of your life. And that it really is good news. That Jesus comes to give to you what no one else can. And to invite you to step into this story with him to let this story become the script for the rest of your life. And it will be a glorious life, tinged with pain and suffering. As Jesus promised, in this world you will have troubles. But it will be a life that is imbued with an incredible joy and meaning and the community of God's people. If that's the step that you want to take to be able to give your life to Him.